We are The Point, a church that loves God, loves people, and loves life. If you are interested in learning more about us, please go to our website, thepointva.com. Thanks for listening. How many people have heard of Pay It Forward? Anybody ever heard of this? It was an initiative. They made a movie about it, but it really actually was a thing that took place. There was a social studies class that was challenged on a Friday afternoon by their teacher who said, your homework this weekend is to simply go home and come up with an idea that would serve the world and make it a better place. So as you can imagine, on Monday, students began showing up, rolling out blueprints for robots and setting up environmental presentations and things like that. And one young man walks to the blackboard and just picks up a piece of chalk, writes the word me on the blackboard and circles it, tells his classmates, this is me. Then he takes that chalk and he draws three lines to three smaller circles above himself. And he tells them, these are three people that I am going to help. And the only thing that I'm going to ask in return is that they pay it forward by helping three other people. Now, as simple as that sounds, it's really quite brilliant when you think about it. For the sake of my inability to do difficult math, we'll say there's 400 people in the building right now. If every single one of us decided tomorrow, I'm going to go out into my community and I'm going to help three people in need. Immediately, 1,200 people's lives would be changed by your service. Now, if those 1,200 paid it forward even one time, now you've got a community college. 3,600 lives are different and changed because each one of us decided to simply serve. Now, if you do the math on this, by about the seventh or eighth time that that kindness gets paid forward, literally millions of lives begin to change when we all do what we're called to do in Scripture anyway, and that's to simply serve. I go to a different church almost every Sunday morning, and lots of times, way too often, this happens. Today it did not, which is a good thing, but I'll show up and get there early, and one of the longstanding congregants or one of the elders from the, from the church, one, one of the um, sacred cows, if you will, w- will approach me, and too often it sounds the same. They'll come up to me and they'll say something like this. <clears throat> Tony, our, uh, our church wasn't growing nothing. We, we weren't really reaching out, serving anybody, doing much of nothing. So uh, we fired our preacher. He's gone. He weren't no good. The whole time they're telling me these stories, I'm like going, if you're not serving anybody, if you're not doing anything as a church, man, you ought to run yourself off, not the guy down front on Sunday. It's up to every single one of us as individuals to advance the cause and message of Christ, not just by the things that we say, but by the way that we live our lives, the way that we love and serve those who so desperately need it. And we were called to serve. Really, Jesus himself started the Pay It Forward initiative. Matthew chapter 10, verse 8, Jesus assembles 12 guys from various backgrounds and situations And he gets these guys all together. Kind of picture like a a football situation. He's out in the field. Jesus is out there. Fellas, let's bring it in. My dream team. I need all you guys in. Let's get in here and huddle up. I want to tell you our game plan. Peter, put the fish down. Come on. Matthew, what are you doing? Get in here. I need everybody in the huddle. Come on. All right, we got everybody in one, two, three, four. Thomas. Okay, yeah. All right, good. Everybody listen, okay? This is going to be our first play. This is our strategy, our game plan. You guys listening? Okay. I want you to go. (laughs) And you got a picture of the disciples with their hands in the huddle going. Go where? Wait, time out, Jesus. Hold on. I don't think you understand. I left my wife and kids behind. I quit my job. I left everything behind to follow you on this great mission. And now you're telling me the game plan is to go? I mean, that's it? Jesus says, yeah, pretty much. I want you guys to go and serve those in need. I want you to lay hands on lepers. I want you to tell people the grace that God has shown you. You know, every one of you guys has received freely. Freely you ought to give. So go and do something, be, serve, go. And Jesus modeled that game plan all the way to the cross at Calvary for each one of us. We were called to serve, not to sit, but to serve. There's a guy named Larry Walters. You might want to write this name down or save it in your phone. Larry Walters, because after I tell you this story, you're going to go, nah, he made that up. That can't be true. 
True story, Larry Walters grew up in Southern California in the 1970s. And Larry had one dream as a young man. As a young boy, Larry just wanted to fly airplanes. When I get big, I'm going to be a pilot. The only problem was Larry was born with horrendous eyesight. You've heard the expression, blind in one eye, can't see out of the other. Larry was almost legally blind in his left eye. So, as he got into high school, he decided to apply to get into the Air Force Academy. They <laughs> rejected that application pretty quickly. And then after high school, he started going around trying to find someone that would just give him a local license so that he could dust crops or, or do something, anything, so that he could fly planes. But everywhere he went, it was the same reaction. Larry, you blind as a bat. Ain't nobody in their right mind going to put you in the cockpit of a plane, son. Frustrated by this, Larry paced back and forth at work. He worked for a film company in Los Angeles. And as he's pacing and trying to realize his dream, trying to figure out, how can I do this? Who, I mean, there's got to be some way. As he's thinking through the situation, he spots in the back corner of the warehouse some weather balloons. And a teeny tiny halfway burned out light bulb went off over Larry's head. And Larry said to himself, I have me a fun idea. <laughs> Gathers up the balloons takes them home, ties the balloons to a lawn chair, ties the lawn chair to a Jeep. He fills up the balloons, goes in the house, gets a couple of sandwiches and sodas and a pop gun. Goes out, gets in the chair, and with the, with the help of all people, his girlfriend, they cut the ropes, and Larry Walters began to fly. It's a true story. He was first spotted by an airplane pilot, all right? Because less than 10 minutes after this, the ropes were cut, Larry was 6,000 feet in the air. Drifting out into the main corridor where planes come out of the Long Beach Airport there. Yeah. Spotted by a pilot, the first person that saw him. Now, could you imagine being on that airplane? <laughs> You're flying into California with your friend, right? You know, like, hey, the Pacific Ocean, it's beautiful. <laughs> Down there's the Staples Center. We should go to a Lakers game while we're here. And there's a guy in a lawn chair. <laughs> There he's just out there <laughs> sitting, eating a sandwich. <laughs> he was later quoted after this whole ordeal was over, and the paper is saying, it was getting kind of dark, so I thought I should come down. Start shooting balloons. <laughs> Serious. A and he went down about as fast as he had gone up. Now, luckily for him, I say luckily, he crashed into some power lines right before he hit the ground, and they literally suspended him from hitting the ground, hurting himself, maybe even losing his life. He didn't have one scratch on him. Knocked out 40 blocks of electricity that day in L.A., but he was fine. And every news crew in town descended on the scene to go to interview, to get this guy's story. Everybody wanted to know about this lunatic in a lawn chair. And as they started to piece his story together, and he's telling them, you know, why he did it, one reporter finally had had enough. He's like, Larry, you know, <laughs> hold on. I get this whole Hollywood against all odds. You know, you wanted to fly, you were blind, no one would lie. I, I get this story you're rolling out for us, but I guess what I got to really ask you is, really? I, I mean, really, a lawn chair and guns and a balloon, why would you do something so crazy? And Larry Walters replied by saying very profoundly, and I quote, I figured I can't just sit there. And that's all I have to say about that. That was his entire rationale behind pulling this stunt. I can't just sit there. And as crazy as it would be to see one of you guys this afternoon floating over the city of Charlottesville in a lawn chair with a bunch of balloons attached to you, let me seriously challenge everybody in this room, myself included, with this question. What would happen if every single one of us in this room adopted that same mentality as a Christ follower? I can't just sit there. I cannot. I can't. Well, what would happen would be this corner of the world would be turned upside down for the cause of Jesus Christ. If Jesus changed the entire world with 12 men, what could he do with nearly a 1,000 of you guys if you'd just let him, if you'd just be willing to serve? This is a great story in the Gospel of John 21. You've heard this story many times. Jesus and Peter have this conversation. 
And Jesus says three words at the end of this conversation. He says three words to Peter that ultimately changed the rest of Peter's life. And by the way, don't ask first grade kids. I, I was at this place about a year ago and asked these little guys, what were three of the last words Jesus said to his friend Peter? One little boy said, eat your spinach? <laughs> no. Those were the last three words Jesus said to Popeye. But Jesus and Peter are having this conversation, and they had been together three and a half years doing ministry. They had gone fishing together, you know, sang songs, built campfires. They walked on the water together. Peter saw Jesus do stuff he couldn't even explain. Now, he's sitting here with this Jesus who just a few days ago was crucified, put in a tomb. And then Peter saw a stone rolled away. In John 21, he's having a conversation with Jesus, the one who had defeated crucifixion, who had beaten death. And Jesus says something pretty special to his friend Peter. They're talking, and Jesus at some point just says, hey, Peter, do you love me? <laughs> of course I love you, Jesus. <laughs> do I love you? Yeah, but, but do you love me? Lord, you just asked me that question. I, come on, you know that I love you very much. And then the word says, Jesus asked Peter a third time. Peter, do you truly love me more than these? Now, Peter had been with Jesus. He knew Jesus' style. Might have even been a little hurt by this reason. Where, 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 are, we, where are we going with this, Lord? Lord, you know all things. Surely you must know that I love you. You've asked me three times. I've told you three times that I love you. I can just imagine Jesus looking at Peter and saying, Peter, you know, if I asked you a hundred times, you would say it a hundred times. Saying it and living it is two different things. Peter, if you love me, feed my sheep. Feed my sheep, Peter. You, you're here, you're singing the songs, you're in fellowship, we're praying together. That's all great, but Peter, if you really love me, feed my sheep. You guys know what James 127 says? Don't worry, no one else does either. James 127 is a verse we never read in church. I've never heard it preached, not once. I don't understand that. To me, it should be like John 3, 16, or I mean, any, any verse that we just know. James 1, 27 says this. Religion that God accepts, see how important it already sounds? And some translations say worship that God accepts is looking after orphans and widows in their distress. And don't be polluted by the world. That's what it says. Acceptable religion to God is looking after those in need. Man, I love that verse. I was born in August 1968. That's right, I'm 82 years old. And the moment I was born, I was placed immediately into the care of an orphanage in western Maryland. It's from a broken home before I ever even got here. My, my birth mother couldn't take care of me. and um, Wasn't really family there to help out or nothing like that. So that's how I started my life. It's an uncared for orphan. But while that was taking place, a 17 year old girl, a teenager, wrote her husband to be a letter. They had gotten engaged, but he got drafted into the US Army and went off to, to serve in Vietnam. She wrote him a letter. She said, I've been praying for you every day. I pray you're safe. I pray this war will end. All you guys will come home. But every day when I've been praying, God's laid on my heart this calling, this, this, this desire to be a mom. I think that's why he put me on this earth is, is to be a mommy. And when I pray, I don't think God wants me to wait until you get back, we get married and have our own kids. I think God wants me to be a mom right now. That GI got that letter and he read it and he said, Say what? <laughs> then he prayed about it. 
And he wrote her back, and he said, you go find a child who has nothing, who has no one. We'll take a man, and we'll raise him together as our own. And so she started looking. During the process, he got back. They got married. And a short time after that, they walked into the room where I was being kept, walked right up to my crib. They picked me. <laughs> Mama. My mom said, we went there to find a little girl. I said, Mom, you missed it by a long shot. <laughs> but she said, I heard you in there playing and giggling. And I looked in and saw you. I mean, the first thing I thought was, I, I don't know the first thing about this kid. He's not my blood. I, I don't know where he came from. I don't know his name. But I know this little boy needs a mommy. So she picked me up along with her 21-year-old husband, they took me out of there, took me home, and for the next 18 years, for the next 40 years, any time <laughs> I needed anything, I always had a roof over my head, clothes on my back, shoes on my feet. I got to play Little League Baseball and go to school. I was taken to church even when I didn't want to go. I was that age, you know. But that's where I met Christ and made him Lord of my life. I know that teenage girl had no clue when she picked me up that 40 years later I'd be standing on a stage in a school in Charlottesville sharing this story, but also pleading on behalf of other kids just like myself, kids born into situations where they, they don't have what they need. They don't have somebody to tell them their love. They don't have anybody to tell them about Christ. And there are so many that are born into this world way worse off than I ever was. A few years ago, my heart was captured by the voice of a child. My minister had called me up and said, hey, you want to go on a missions trip to El Salvador? I said, yeah. Got off the phone and Googled El Salvador. I could have been going to Russia. I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> Got in a plane and flew down there. This little beautiful Pacific Coast country just south of Mexico, not really that far from here. As soon as I got off that plane, I have to tell you, I understood as soon as I stepped off. And I have to say this today. We are lucky that we live here. We're lucky to be Americans. We are. Regardless of politics and the economy, all that stuff, we are fortunate that we live here. We're not blessed because we have these, these great buildings or SUVs out in the parking lot or bank accounts or any of that stuff. That stuff doesn't make us blessed. Our, our stuff, our, our resources don't make us blessed. Our resources make us responsible. Our blessing is the person of Christ, what he did on the cross, what he does for us today and into eternity. He is our blessing. But you better believe we're lucky we live here. I got off that plane in the first hour of interacting with the people in San Salvador. I witnessed for the first time in my life child starvation. I saw it happen right in front of me. I thought, you know, I, I thought this only happened on the other side of the planet somewhere. There it was. As I started to interact with the young families there and these young moms, teenagers, it didn't take long for me to figure out. These people, for the most part, they, they have no idea what God's done for them. They're, they're existing with no knowledge of Christ and a poverty of hope. One of the guys said, I want to go by this place that helps out orphans and kids in need. Of course, my ears perked right up. Yeah, let's go there. He took us to this place, this building, Compassion. I was like, hmm. When inside, one of the ladies greeted us. She said, we are so glad that you came here today. Just yesterday, we had a little boy and girl, brother and sister, sponsored into our program. They live right down the street. We would love for you guys to take some supplies down to their house. So we jumped in a truck and a Jeep, and we drove down through these shanties where, I mean, people were stacked on top of people, little eight-by-eight eight spaces housing like, you know, nine people. Just unbelievable amount of people stuck in these little places. Eventually, we pulled out past that area, and we pulled into this uh, kind of country area. There was this big open field. And all I could see when we pulled into the field, we went off the road, we were driving through the field, was this stack of raw cinder blocks. As we got up a little bit closer and they turned off the Jeep, it was pretty obvious. That stack of blocks over there, that's their house. We got out and we're walking over to it. They had put a piece of tent on top of it, and they had a little 
plastic shower curtain. That was our front door. I pulled that curtain, and when I stepped inside, the first thing I saw, they said that there was, there was two kids there. There wasn't. There was four. The two that were sponsored, they took off for school. Compassion takes care of that. And the other two waited behind. One was this, this little five-year-old, six-year-old girl, Maria. A pair of shorts is all she had on. She's sitting in this just dirt floor. I remember there being ants all over the place, and she's just sitting there. And I stepped in with my box of supplies. Our eyes happened to meet. She looked up at me when she saw that I had supplies. And the guy next to me had a big old thing of clean water he was carrying in. The guy behind him had a big old bag of rice on his shoulder. She looked up at me, and those little brown eyes doubled in size. Smile went from ear to ear. Just kept looking at me. She stood up, her little hand started shaking. It was like she was about to hyperventilate. But she would not take her eyes off of me. She was fixated on me. Might have been the glare now that I think about it. And then she started talking to me. And I mean like 100 words a minute. She is talking and talking. I'm just smiling. I have no idea what you're saying, honey. I said, no, hold on a second. Hold on. I got the interpreter. I said, ma'am, could you come here? Ever since we walked in here, this little girl's been going crazy, man. She's talking. I, I don't know what she's telling me, though. The interpreter came and listened for a minute, and she looked at me, and she said, this child just said to you, somebody in America loves my brother and sister, and one day someone's going to love me too. I had a hard time with that. I remember looking at her thinking, I know what it is to be in need. That's how I got here, too. But I also know what happens when we pour love into the life of a child who has none. I'm going to stand here today because somebody just like you, a stranger to me, cared enough to make some sacrifices, take me in, love on me, and tell me about Christ. That teenage girl that picked me up, that was my good Samaritan. I thank God for her every day of my life. I went over, and Maria was there. I put my arm around her and squeezed her little neck. I said, well, I love you right now. And she didn't understand a word. She just. We're not saved by the things we do. Only by the grace of God and blood of Jesus do any one of us have any hope. But isn't it crazy that. Jesus said in Matthew 25, one day we'll all leave this place. We'll have our last day on this earth. And on that great getting up morning when we stand before God, Jesus says, we're going to be asked one question. It could have been anything. But Jesus says, you're going to be asked this question. Be ready. What did you do for the least of my brothers? Because I'll tell you, whatever you did for them, That's what you did for me. What will you say, church? What will I say? This is Alba Gutierrez. Alba lives in Colombia. She was about four. I brought her up here today because you go to like a concert or big event and you always hear them. Guy will get up at the end. I want to show you a child packet here. They call these child I hate that. You know why? This isn't a packet. This isn't a piece of paper. This is a real human being. This is a real little girl. Alba's real. And she has a need this morning that we don't even begin to understand or comprehend in this country. Look, I've been to the Indian reservations in Arizona. We've got people in the Appalachians here living in cardboard boxes. But I can tell you from being to El Salvador, Kenya, Ethiopia, Mexico, all over the world watching Compassion do this all through the local church. These kids need you this morning. So that's what I want to ask you guys to do today. When we get done, go through those doors, walk out. To, there's a table right out there. And alongside of Alba, I'm going to have another 50 or 60 kids out there. 
I could desperately use your help today. You go out, you pick up one, that's the hard part. They're all going to look at you. Turn it over, you fill out a little blue card. It takes 30 seconds to fill out this card. You change a child's life like Alba forever. And then what happens? Well, you start sponsoring the child. And how, what does that mean? Well, it's a bill. You'd send Alba a dollar and eight cents a day. That's what we're talking about. A dollar and eight cents. What possible good could that do? Well, Alba would have full medical coverage. Man, I wish I could get full medical for my kids for a dollar a day. That ain't going to happen. Three meals a day, clean water, clothing, shoes, full education through grade 12. You are giving this child a life that she doesn't currently have. And best of all, Compassion never apologizes for sharing the gospel, first and foremost. They want these kids to know Jesus Christ so you can speak truth into their life. My family, we, we sponsor five. There's a letter in my mailbox every other week from a different one. They will write you letters. <laughs> and you can write back and say, Alba, you know what? You matter to God. He's got a plan for your life, just like he did mine. Learn to prosper you, not to harm you. I want to give you a hope and a future. That's what his word says. Dollar eight cents is a McDonald's sweet tea or a Coke, a small. Who could buy a small Coke at McDonald's right now? I'm just curious, show of hands. Come on, y'all ain't that poor. Everybody put your hand up. You know you buy a Coke at McDonald's. I was at this church like a couple months ago. This lady down front goes, I get my drinks from Starbucks. I said, well, you could take 10 of these kids then. <laughs> it's perspective. <laughs> Men, <laughs> leaders of your families, my wife challenged me eight years ago when we took our first one. She said, you know what? We have four kids of our own that we feed every day, clothe, take care of. We have everything we need. Jesus died for us. You think we as a family could cancel one pizza night a month so that a child could know Christ, so that a child could survive? What could I say? This is not about guilt or anything like that. I don't work for compassion, never have, probably never will. But I've been there and I've seen it and it's real. So if you feel convicted today, I want you to go out there and pick up one of these kids. You can take two of them. You can take as many as you want and release them from poverty in Jesus' name, through compassion. I also want to say this to you today. There are plenty of ways for you to serve Christ. This is just one way to make a tangible kingdom difference today. But past that, you saw the video. Reach. Man, you, I've talked to people out here. They're going on a trip. Go on a trip with these guys. With your church, go on a trip. You will see things that will change your perspective, change the way you look at your faith and your life forever. So please get involved with Reach. You can change kids' lives, communities' lives right through that ministry. There are opportunities in your neighborhoods, in your schools, in your workplaces. At the point, Dave, are there opportunities to serve here? Yep, there's two opportunities to serve here, two and only two. I'm kidding. There's unlimited opportunity. It's like, what are you doing? Unlimited opportunity right here to serve him. And if there's anyone that showed up here today that has never made Jesus Lord of their life, I want to say this to you. This is what Jesus calls you to as a life of loving and serving others. So if you don't know him today, there's people in front of you, back of you, both sides. I'm here. Dave, all these guys are here today. would love to share with you what it means to follow Christ and to be a devoted follower, to make him Lord of your life today, to know when you leave this place where you're going. I want to pray for you. You're going to see a short video. I want you to see this video because... Five years ago, my wife and I picked up, our, at that time, our third child, a little girl from Kenya named Elizabeth, having no idea that two years later we would be in Kenya and would have the opportunity to spend a few days with her. I want you to see when you pick up one of these packets, you are really changing a specific life. Let me pray for you guys. God, thank you so much for loving us, for serving us with the life of your son, Father, adopting us into your family by parting with your only child to die a horrifying death that we might live. Father, we'll never fully grasp or understand your grace, your mercy. But today we just say thank you. Lord, I pray that today every family here, every person here might be challenged, might be convicted to, to be here to pray more, maybe to serve in the nursery or to get involved in the youth ministry or, or to go on a trip with Reach. And today, this very day, Father, I pray everybody in this place is, is moved to walk out there and pick up a child and Help that child know who Jesus Christ is, not just by sharing the gospel, but also by living it through their service to that kid. Lord, thank you so much 
for all you do for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I believe that Jesus is worth living for because he believed that I was worth dying for. Check this out. My name's Tony Wolf. I'm here in Kenya, Africa. My wife and I came down here uh, to see how compassion impacts community and children through the local church. Compassion's uh, care and ministry to children um, and, and concern for their spirituality uh, was so evident as we um, arrived. Uh, we got out of our vehicles uh, and we were greeted by a gigantic group of children who were dancing and singing and celebrating not our arrival, but um, the relationship that they had with God and what He has done in their lives. We've been able to see um, the Maasai people and how they've been affected uh, through compassion and the work done through the local church. We were even able to see the actual child folders that are kept by the projects, which contained maps to where they lived, um, their, their medical history, how they do in school with their studies. Like you're good at reading. <laughs> even where the child is spiritually and where their walk with Christ is, which showed me that this is not a blanket ministry uh, that's generically done for a mass. This is specific one-on-one -on -one ministry where Compassion in the local church is able to say, we care about you and we care about your relationship with Christ. This is the day God has given us to rejoice. One of the things we were really looking forward to uh, was meeting one of our sponsored children, Elizabeth. Seeing her for the first time really brought to life uh, our sponsorship. <laughs> She's a bit shy, but yeah. she That's good. That's good. To actually come here and see that this wasn't just uh, a packet, it was a real person um, standing in the field uh, with a little smile and beautiful dress that we found out later uh, she had actually gotten from a Christmas gift we sent her. Um, it just really uh, brought to life the fact that she was a real person and that she's part of our family. From her child packet, we knew that Elizabeth had a, a brother and sister and lived with her dad. So we decided to, to, as a gift to bring her uh, some things that they could use around the house. But the thing that she really liked was um, this pink owl that my middle daughter Katie had picked out for. We gave that to her at the beginning of the day and it never left her side. Um, as it turns out, um, it was the first toy that she had ever received. It was really hard to believe that at age seven, she had never received a toy before. We also, uh, at the end of the visit, I was able to give her a Bible that I've actually preached and spoken out of for about 10 years, but that now she would be able to, to hold on to the message of Christ herself. As the children sang, I couldn't understand one word they were saying uh, verbally, but the language uh, was very clear to understand that we are here to worship a God who is faithful, a God who will never leave us, never desert us, and that loves us and cares for each one of us individually. I'm Tony Wolf. I'm here in Kenya. Won't you join me in releasing a child from poverty in Jesus' name? Jesus name.